Hi everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor asserts that General Hodges consistently disseminates uninformed and dishonest statements. Hodges, a former commander, led a small force in Germany. Post-Cold War. Grieger alleges that Hodges is financially incentivized to promote conflict with Russia, making him staunchly anti-Russian and overly optimistic. Despite ongoing dialogue for months, Hodges refuses to acknowledge reality, which McGregor believes is due to his lack of financial gain from doing so. And McGregor recalls how retired generals and Washington insiders during the Ukrainian conflict misled the public by portraying Russian incompetence in Ukrainian victory. He highlights a disconnect between public perception and reality, citing the catastrophic consequences of unchecked warfare in Ukraine, despite warnings from sources like the Ukrainian prosecutor general who disclosed significant casualties. Western media continues to echo misleading narratives. Oh no, those are Russians. They've suffered far fewer losses, perhaps at a ratio of one to seven in climbing. Terrible advice inundated the Ukrainians, along with equipment they lack the expertise to utilize effectively, resulting in a nation in ruins and graves continuously being filled. Russians are now even capturing elderly men and boys as young as 14 or 15 in uniform, resorting to press gangs to bolster Ukrainian military ranks. Western Ukrainians are horrified, reluctant to be drawn into a conflict they universally abhor. If the truth were widely acknowledged, Zelensky would be seen as a complete fraud. More interested in selling out Ukraine to corporate interests like BlackRock and its subsidiaries than serving his country. The exploitation of Ukrainians by external powers is evident, with casualties among Americans, contractors, and soldiers reaching an estimated 450 to 500, although the administration remains reticent to disclose the exact figures despite claims of minimal harm to American interests. The reality of exploitation for perceived benefits is stark. Economically, Russia has emerged stronger and healthier than before, leading a movement towards the gold standard that threatens the U.S.'s position as the world's primary currency printer. Russia's military capabilities, including a formidable army and improved air force, underscore its resilience, while revelations about the inadequacies of American equipment paint a picture of weakness and self-serving greed on the global stage. When I mention we, I'm referring to the famous military-industrial congressional complex, which continues to push for funding, knowing well that the money won't significantly benefit Ukraine or its equipment, but will instead line pockets here. It's a disgraceful fraud all around, likely to be dissected in a PBS Frontline documentary years from now. While those producing such content currently support the ongoing tragic war with millions fleeing Ukraine, the country faces serious challenges. Exactly. But he's part of the proverbial swamp. Most of us in our organization, our country, our choice, have realized that there's little difference between Republicans and Democrats in Washington. Regardless of whom you vote for, policies remain the same. It's a bipartisan unit party pursuing the agenda you described, Stephen. Absolutely. I hope every American understands this, though I doubt they do. Initially, I welcomed the report, thinking it would end things. I was surprised, as you rightly note, that Zelensky, perhaps one of the most corrupt figures in European politics, didn't seize the opportunity for change. Instead, it's become another round of passing the hat and throwing money in for what he calls reparations, essentially a rerun of the earlier scam involving BlackRock, Larry Fink, and others. It's tragic, but the Senate seems pleased, particularly Mitch McConnell, who undoubtedly stands to profit along with his colleagues. It's all a scam now. Switzerland, too, faces trouble as its recent alignment with the EU and NATO compromises its neutrality. A significant loss for global diplomacy. It's no longer the case. Even if the Russians were invited at this juncture, I doubt they would entertain the idea. It's akin to the tragedy of losing Finland as a neutral state in Sweden. These were places where conflicting parties could negotiate and resolve matters, but not anymore. I suspect the Russians would reject the notion, questioning why they should pay attention to Zelensky or us. They've achieved victory in the war, despite ongoing skirmishes. When you're sending individuals of varying ages and pregnant women into action, one must question the notion of winning. And the Russians are steadily advancing across the front, and will likely continue until they reach a certain point. However, 
They're not keen on extending much further as ruling Ukrainians poses significant challenges. They'd rather avoid lessons from history, such as the burden of the Warsaw Pact and the drain of Cuba on the Soviet economy have informed their stance. They've realized that pursuing conflict is counterproductive to their interests, especially when they aspire to play a central role in facilitating trade between China and the West. The Chinese to understand that war is detrimental to business. Contrary to popular belief in America, it's my hope that people will eventually see through Zelensky's agenda. But that won't happen overnight. Well, first of all, there's nothing hypothetical about it. It's a sham, an attempt to justify the ongoing situation in Ukraine and prolong it. The notion that people will look at this map and fear the imminent arrival of the Russians is absurd. They're not coming. This narrative serves to keep figures like Schultz and Macron, along with other globalists, in power. Schultz, for instance, is about as popular as the plague in Germany currently, and there's a dilemma about who will succeed him. While there may be some potential candidates within Alternative for Germany, or even the old communist faction, there's no one as definitive as figures like Helmut Schmidt or Helmut Kohl were decades ago. The Germans find themselves in a precarious situation, akin to a dying, beached whale, having to industrialize and struggling with an influx of unwanted foreigners, similar to the challenges faced by Scandinavians. The globalists have effectively harmed Europe. And while some believe it's irreparable, I disagree, though the road to recovery will be arduous. The tactic of instilling fear by suggesting the Russians is reminiscent of Cold War discussions and plans from the 1970s or 80s, but this time it's baseless. Hopefully the Germans will dismiss it with a contempt it deserves. Although many in Western Europe, Poland and elsewhere still place some degree of trust in their mainstream media which in reality fails to provide genuine honesty to truly understand global events. One must delve into alternative sources, often overlooked by mainstream platforms, influenced by financial and governmental interests, all in the hands of the same people who are attempting to perpetuate these situations and maintain the facade. That official for us, we all recognize it's not. But there are still too many individuals eager to embrace the sentiment of wanting to believe, akin to what you used to hear on the X-Files. I want to believe in UFOs or something similar. That's the challenge we need to address. I believe that's the plan. Tony Blinken is associates, Larry Fink and even Zelensky. They're all part of the same class, driven by the desire to line their pockets with cash. Unless someone intervenes and puts a stop to it, my heart goes out to the Ukrainians. I have a deep connection to them from my upbringing. They've been misled by this government since day one, exploiting their nationalism, courage, and valor to devastating effect. RFK Jir seems to be one of the few who's identified the culprits, intent on destroying what little remains of Ukraine, and has courageously spoken the truth about it. I wish more candidates would follow suit, but unfortunately, we're not hearing it. First and foremost, all your viewers need to take a moment and recognize that discussions about bombing Iran have been ongoing for the past 30 years. I recall during my active duty days, hearing John McCain repeat the old refrain about bombing Iran. The neocon globalist faction has persistently sought a war with Iran. It's worth remembering that what prevented war with Iran last time in 2019 was Donald Trump's decision to say no. There was a deliberate provocation when a global hawk flew on the edge of the air defense identification zone orchestrated by figures like General McKenzie, John Bolton, and Secretary of State Pompeo. They knew the risk involved, but thankfully, Trump's refusal averted a potential catastrophe, highlighting the importance of reason, rationality, and peacekeeping efforts. Then they have the right to shoot it down, as specified in intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance law which aligns with the purpose of the global hawk. The Iranians observed the situation closely and eventually decided to take it down. This decision was met with jubilation inside the Beltway, particularly by the usual suspects who saw it as a pretext for war with Iran. Figures like General Keane have been vocal. Supporters profiting from the escalation saw the downing of the global hawks as the trigger they needed to push for military action against Iran. They even brought vans loaded with expensive technology to the White House, aiming to transform it into a war headquarters. They descended upon President. 